Hello everyone, and welcome back to our Divine Liturgy course. Today, we will be talking about the whole part of Divine Liturgy that deals with the catechumens, okay? And what we're talking about is those preparing for baptism. In case you didn't know, the word catechumen comes from two words in Greek, kata, which means down, but in this case it means thoroughly, and ihi, which means sound or any sort of noise. It's a little complicated to understand why this has to do with the word catechumen, but what it means is that a catechumen is thoroughly being uh, instructed in the form of sound. In other words, orally instructed. One who is being instructed orally. This is important. Why? Because from ancient times, when we have this expression of the catechumenate and catechumens, it was presumed uh, and important, and it still is, that we learn the faith from live people. Okay? Now that we have recordings, we might not necessarily be instructed in the faith by face-to-face -face contact with live carriers of the faith, more experienced than ourselves. Anyway, that's what catechumen means. And uh, we'd like to know, although I'm not going to go very thoroughly into the history of something like the catechumenate, but I will cover it briefly, we might know that the parts about the catechumens, and the parts I'm talking about are the litany for the catechumens, uh, that begins with the words, catechumens, pray to the Lord, and let us, the faithful, pray for the catechumens. And then there's the silent, usually read silently, uh, prayer of the priest for the catechumens. Okay, And the third part we'll be talking about, but that part will already be in our next video, coming out the same time as this one, don't worry, um, is the dismissal of the catechumens when we part with them. Theoretically, anyway. All right. Um, I would just like to indicate to you that uh, we're talking about those preparing for baptism, uh, adult baptism. Obviously, babies uh, would not be prepared by this kind of instruction. So the the increasing frequency of infant baptism affected, of course, uh, throughout the uh, centuries uh, in early Byzantium and then middle Byzantium affected the relevance of something like a public uh, instruction of adults in the faith, okay, as the faith became widespread in the Byzantine realm. Uh, and now you will know that in some parishes this whole part about the catechumens is even entirely omitted. Um, and there is a pastoral decision made uh, in the interests of making the liturgy shorter, uh, perhaps, or uh, perhaps because in the parish there happen not to be any adults preparing for baptism. Um, the decision is made to omit this part, but I'd like to suggest to you today, when we will look at the, uh, some of the petitions for the catechumens, and in our next video at the Silent Prayer of the Priest, I would like to suggest to you that those of us who have already received baptism uh, also benefit, okay, benefit from being reminded of being works in progress, yes, also after baptism. It's not like we're all perfectly instructed in the faith. Many people in our time have not been instructed at all, um, despite having been baptized. Okay, so in general terms, to tell you a bit about the history of the catechumenate in Constantinople, I would draw your attention to a publication by uh, uh, an art, it's an article by, written by my mentor a long time ago, Father Robert Taft, the famous uh, liturgiologist of the Byzantine Rite. He does have an article. You might Google it and find it somewhere. I only have an off-print that he gave me. Um, it's might Anyway, it might also be one of the chapters in his books, but it's called, uh, it's by Robert Taft, S.J., When Did the Catechumenate Die Out in Constantinople? Okay, I've written all over it, so doesn't look very presentable, but uh, it's an important article, and you can find, if you're interested, 
the gory details on the history. I will briefly just summarize and tell you that we have scattered bits of information. It's not easy all the time to restore a historical development, okay? But we connect the dots between the scattered bits of information we have. So what are some of these bits? Well, in St. John Chrysostom's time, okay, go back to the end of the 4th and beginning of the 5th centuries. In Chrysostom's time, we know for a fact that the adult catechumenate, meaning a public sort of program, okay, for preparation for baptism and instructing people in the faith, was in full bloom. Okay, we have evidence of that. But then, again, centuries later, we see that in the 6th and 7th century, we see this development in the 6th century. Infants are usually being baptized in Constantinople on the 40th day already, okay? And then in the 7th century, at the time of the life of St. Maximus the Confessor, one of the famous commentators on the Byzantine liturgy, well, in one of his works, not actually in his commentary called the Mystagogy of St. Maximus, but in another work, St. Maximus says that the dismissal of catechumens, uh, it doesn't happen. It's a dead letter. Okay, so we have that evidence. And what is happening, eventually we see clearly by the 10th century that what's happening is a tendency to privatize and make a family affair out of the Christian initiation rites, okay? Not only of catechism, instruction in the faith, but also of baptism itself, okay? It's no longer what it used to be, all right? What it used to be was this public affair within the praying community of the parish or the cathedral, okay? Um, and at specific feasts that were designated um, for public baptisms of adults, for example, Holy Saturday, maybe everybody knows that in the ancient church, Holy Saturday was a day of public baptisms. Um, you know, that would be at, at the conclusion of sometimes a, a, a program of many years of preparing for baptism um, at a special feast like Holy Saturday or sometimes the eve of Christmas. That was also practiced. Um, the catechumens would be uh, baptized. Anyway, uh, already by the 10th century, <clears throat> this is not happening, uh, not only because of infant baptism, but a tendency to privatize the initiation rites. Okay, enough said about the history, everybody. I'd like to uh, point out to you some of the petitions that I think are instructive for all of us, whether or not we have been baptized, okay? So let's look at three of the petitions of the usually proclaimed by a deacon, well, if there is a deacon, or by the priest, I mean, if you hear this litany at all, it's the litany for the catechumens. So, after the invitation of the deacon, um, catechumens pray to the Lord and let us, the faithful, pray for the catechumens. Uh, the deacon will say, or the priest, that the Lord will have mercy on them. But here's what I wanna uh, talk about and draw my attention to during liturgy, okay? Um, when the deacon says that he will teach them the word of truth. It says in the Greek, ton logon Now, my ears will perk up at this point because I need to be taught the word of truth, catechized in the word of truth every day, right? I haven't completely learned everything there is to know, right? So hopefully we're all teachable, we continue to have teachability, okay, to be able to hear, because that's what a catechumen is, is one who is being instructed orally. So we have the capacity to listen to the word of truth continuously, right? Um, then another petition that he will reveal to them the gospel of righteousness. So we're praying about something being uncovered for us, revealed. In the Greek, I believe this is Apocalypse of Tis to Evangelion Tis Dikeosinis. And um, this Apocalypse, you know, you might recognize the word Apocalypse, right? The Apocalypse is the book of Revelation, right? So 
we need to have our eyes opened continuously also, right? Here we're praying that the catechumens have to them revealed the gospel of righteousness. It's not the same thing as simply reading the gospel, right? But for certain truths really to be uncovered. You see, um, apocalypse, this word apocalypse, or uh, to reveal, um, it comes from apo, which means un, right? And kaliptin is to cover, so uncover. All right, anyway, um, what else would I like to tell you? I would like to indicate to you just one more of these um, petitions, actually, that he will unite them to his holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Unite to the Church. Now, are we always in perfect unity with the Church, just with one another and with God? Well, no. Time and again, we do slip out of unity, right? So we're praying for the catechumens that they be united, okay? And nosi aftus ti agia aftu catholici ke apostoliki ecclesia. So is this uh, an everyday thing that I have to pray for, for my own unity and not self-isolation, right, that I might tend to in sin? Um, yes, I have to think about constantly renewing unity with God and others, and ultimately that is the Church, right, in the body of Christ. So unity. So three things in these petitions we're asking that we continuously be teachable, right, when we say that he teach them the word of truth, well, that we continue also to learn the word of truth, that he will reveal to them the gospel of righteousness. So we want to our eyes to be opened, right, because as our Lord says at the end of the Gospel according to John chapter 9, you know, the whole story about the man born blind and about when our Lord talks about spiritual blindness at the end, well, this is a consistent human issue that we have. So we need to have things revealed to us in the Gospel continuously and unity that he will unite them to. Curiously, the Church here is called, called holy, catholic, and apostolic, what word is missing? The curious thing is the word one is missing. doesn't mean the church isn't one, that's not what I'm saying, but I find it curious that our divine liturgy omits that word of all words. Anyway, doesn't seem to find it crucial here. But anyway, unity is mentioned here. All right, that's it for this video, my friends. I hope you find it helpful uh, as to uh, some better you know, participation or your ability to participate at Divine Liturgy. And in my very next video, which we will, we will be putting out at the same time as this one, I will now talk about the silent prayer of the priest for the catechumens. Now, I won't go, you know, to great lengths or I won't take too much uh, time up to, to read that prayer, but I'll explain some of it. And then we'll talk about the dismissal of the catechumens when they are told by a deacon or deacons, sometimes just by the priest, to depart. So tune in for that right after this video.